What's happening, guys? Welcome back to the Nutrition Blueprint Podcast. In today's episode, we had the chance to interview um, a really good friend of mine. He's a fellow registered dietitian from Canada. His name is Andy DeSantis. And in today's conversation, we cover a really, really interesting topic, which is acid reflux. We went into detail into understanding why it happens, how you can treat it, how you can manage it. And we even dabble a little, a little bit into like the whole entire like area of intermittent fasting. Andy has written seven books on different kinds of topics as it relates to nutrition and it was a really great conversation that i hope you get to enjoy today hey guys welcome back to the nutrition blueprint podcast i have a wonderful and amazing guest today he's actually if you follow me for a while you may have remember him his name is andy desantis um he is a Canadian, one of our content developers, Mackenzie. She's a Canadian too. So she was pretty excited about having Andy on the podcast. Uh, so just a quick little background on Andy. He's a private practice dietitian. He's a blogger and author uh, from Toronto, Canada. He graduated from the University of Toronto School of Public Health with a master's in public health nutrition before working with Diabetes Canada and the research and education department. From there, Andy combined his dual passions of one-on-one -on -one counseling and public education by pursuing private practice um, and were writing a social media became sort of like pivotal roles in his success. He now has published seven books. I think you had zero by the time that I actually Probably. chatted the last time. So I think you come a long way uh, and he's afraid to share his love of kale. I do remember the kale t-shirts uh, from a while back oh. and good old fashioned poop joke in the name of education. Oh. So Andy, welcome to the show, man. What's going on? Thanks for having me. You know, uh, what's going on? Well, you know, here in uh, here in Canada, it's a, it's a lot of lockdown stuff, but I'm making the most of it. You know what I mean? Writing, helping people uh, from home a lot. And yeah. uh, and I, we, we just talked before. I can't really complain, you know, still doing what I love and in a pretty fortunate position. So just enjoying the ride, you know? Yeah. So curious, like, how did it, uh, the pandemic affect you? Like, were you like working from home back then? Or you were actually working like you had an actual office and everything back, back then when, when, when the pandemic started to hit? So yeah, I, I have and still do have an office. Um, and you know, I'm in, I'm in Toronto. So Toronto is a, is a big city, right? Like for, for people who don't know Toronto, like it's like New York city light. So the density of people's high, there's a subway system. So it does make sense to have an office because there's enough people who would want to come in. Um, so I do have an office, obviously have, I haven't gone to the office as much this year as I did last year. Um, but what's funny though, is like the, and with the current rules, technically dietitians can see people in person and, and, but the exhilaration I get now when I have that odd in-person appointment is so high because it's just like, I love the in-person stuff as much as online works. So it's really interesting. I'll sit down when I have an in-person now, which is so infrequent and I'm just hyped up. You know what I mean? It's funny. Now, how many, how many books did you write out of like, you know, during this pandemic time? And I, I, I know we, we kind of had a topic that we discussed at the beginning before we yeah. hit that record button, but, and we'll kind of get into that in a minute, but uh, yeah. I'm curious on, you know, like writing seven books is a big feat, dude. Like, well, what, what have you written about? And, and I know you're huge into writing, so I think it just comes naturally to you, but you know, what are some of the stuff that you've written in the past? Yeah. So books I've written so far, um, pescatarian book and, and to be perfectly honest and we can talk about this if you want but shortly after i wrote that uh i actually be uh, basically became pescatarian so i've been dabbling in that for a bit although the publisher at the time this is a this is the first time in secret i wasn't actually pescatarian at the time you were but vegan they, right no 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 no. people no no i'm not that's, that's the thing let's let's actually talk about this for a second right so people think actually that uh, i'm vegan or, or whatever i'm actually not so it just i know i talk about soy a lot but the reason i do that is because i just think that you know, diversifying your protein intake and being open to different things is important for good health. It's not because I'm pushing people into veganism. So I'm not vegan, but people do think that. It's funny, right? So you I thought think, that obviously, I think we right? would, they, they, I think that they're associated with like, uh, for some reason, kale and veganism, I guess, somehow go together. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. It, it, you, you could probably, you would probably think that I, I was, you know what I mean? I could see that. I could see that, but I'm just pushing that side of it because I think that people need to hear more of that side to have like, you know, a little bit of variety. So that's, that's where I come from, but uh, okay. it's not the, it's not the first time I got that. So um, pescatarian was one book. Pescatarian was one. I've written uh, two on the dash diet. My first book was on the dash diet. That was like a bigger one that had like workouts in it. It was more like a robust one. And my second one was more like a quick one for beginners. So I wrote two on that, wrote a low sodium cookbook, which is just like 
they're more generic. You know what I mean? Um, I wrote acid reflux cookbook, one of that we spoke about, I'm very proud of. I've actually also wrote an uh, intermittent fasting book as well, where I did a lot of research on intermittent fasting. Um, that's a topic I'm definitely interested in. And, you know, these days it's a, it's a topic a lot of people are curious about. And so I've written that and, uh, and the low cholesterol control. that you have in the background. Yeah, right? low cholesterol. Yeah, I love that one as well. Um, and, you know, the reality is, like, in Canada specifically, I'm sure it's the same in the States, like, blood pressure, cholesterol, acid reflux. These are the three most co- three of the most commonly prescribed medications, right? So in dietitians, we don't, we, you know, if possible, we love people not to need medication. So then why not write books on these topics? That's, that's so, the way. So I'm guessing that was, like, sort of, like, the reasoning behind, like, you know, the how you pick those topics based on, like, the, the biggest kind of issues that you kind of see in Canada. And, I'm, I, mean, I mean, a lot of the different, different things also apply here in the U.S., right? Basically, yeah. Basically, I wanted to touch on topics that were affecting the most people. Um, I would love in the future to write a book on nutrition and mental health. And, and you know, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm got too much going on now, but eventually I would love to write that as well. Well, you did mention a couple of topics that I'm interested in. One is one I'm pretty knowledgeable in, and I would love to kind of dabble yeah. a little bit into like, sure. you know, your, your thoughts on it, which is intermittent fasting, because that was my master's thesis. And I, I worked That's a lot on, on, on those kind of things, but also acid reflux. And the main reason is because I recently started working with, um, and we can maybe kind of get into this, like, you know, as yeah, we yeah. Like, like get into like the, the, the nitty gritty details here. But so about six, seven months ago, I started working with uh, one of my clients. He's a doctor, actually. He's a doctor yeah. in, um, um, originally from Nigeria, um, and he practices in like uh, New Mexico. So one of the things that he mentioned is like, oh, I can't have this. I can't have that. I can't have that. And I was like, why? Because I get really bad acid reflux. Right. So and then I started like asking a lot of questions. And one of the things for me is like, I feel like acid reflux. Well, first of all, we'll define it. I'll let you do that in a minute. Uh, but it also it's it sometimes can be food related, but a lot of times could be stress related. So I, I perhaps like we wanted to kind of like dive deeper into a few different things like that. So yep. like acid reflux is something like, you know, it's a very prevalent thing in many people. I've experienced it not chronically, but I know a lot of people deal, deal with this on like a, almost on a daily basis. And it's actually pretty uh, prohibitive and many different things with what they do and what they eat. So what is it? Yeah. And to people listening in, so they know some context yeah. here. Yeah. Well, it, it'll be helpful if we just look at like the three key words, right? Heartburn, which is like the symptom, acid reflux, which is like the actual act of the acid coming up through the esophagus, and then GERD, which is the actual classification when you have acid reflux at a certain level of frequency that's actually considered a condition. Mm-hmm. You know what I okay, mean? So, so we so, got the three things. Yeah. So you got those three things that, and honestly, I'm guilty. People use them interchangeably, but which is fine because we all know, we kind of know what you mean. And I do that too sometimes, but those are the three things we're talking about and they are all related, right? So heartburn is the feeling of, is the feeling you get when the acid comes up in the stomach and the esophagus because there's a, there's some weakness or something going on with the actual, the, the connection between the esophagus and the stomach, uh, acid reflux is the act of that. And again, GERD is the condition when it keeps happening to you chronically, okay. right? So it's pretty much as simple as that. And GERD is, was it gastroesophageal reflux, reflux. disease, yeah. right? That's yeah. kind of like what that stands for. Okay. Yeah. So in, in the talk about, I guess like, you know, we can maybe do a quick little like, you know, overview of anatomy here. Some people understand exactly well, what way it happens. Because from what I know, obviously, like you have your esophagus, which is basically what kind of transfers food, obviously from your stomach down to, or from your mouth up to, like, down to your stomach. But there's yeah. like what we call, I guess like they call them sphincter. So they're like yeah. this little like uh, gates, you know, like maybe kind of walk through a little bit on like the process and when does that process becomes faulty which maybe lead to like you know that acid and why is it acid why do we have that feeling right well yeah so that that sphincter we're talking about here is called the they they refer to it as the les the lower esophageal sphincter you know what i mean and like i'm, I'm not a, a anatomy professor but i know enough to know that's what it's called and essentially you know this is supposed to open when it's supposed to open and it's supposed to close when it's supposed to close, right? Now, there's a number of reasons why that stops working properly. And that's going to be what we're going to probably talk about in a second with all these causes. But when that functionality fails, that's when you, that's one of the main reasons why the acid, which the gastric acid, which is supposed to stay in the stomach, can come back up the esophagus. That is the acid reflux. And the heartburn you get as a result, you know, the burning sensation. Well, that's, that's what we call heartburn. Right. So that, that the, the, when this functionality is not working the way it should, as in it's not opening when it's supposed to open, not closing when it's supposed to close for a number of reasons, whatever the reason is. And again, we'll get into it. That is essentially what we're talking about. 
Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and and I think a lot of people probably like just kind of like wondering. It's like, and, and I guess like the first question that we'll go on uh, here, and, and when it comes down to factors and and and, and causes yeah. of it is, you know, is it just food that is like kind of causing this? Yeah. So this this is the most interesting question, right? Because in my research and writing the book, right, what I learned is that it's actually it's probably a bit more about how you eat than what you eat. What you eat obviously has a role to play, but 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 what I'm gonna I'm gonna clarify what I mean by that. So people often think about trigger foods, like you just cited, like your client, right? I can't eat this, I can't eat that. Now the evidence for a, a predetermined set of trigger foods is not very high, right? Now that doesn't mean to say that someone may have a trigger food, you know, onions, garlic, chocolate, spicy food, caffeine. It's possible, very possible, but there's not enough evidence across the population of people with this condition to say you should avoid all these things if you have acid reflux, okay? So this is the first thing I learned, um, you know, in looking into this. So that's the first part. And so that brings us to the second part, right? Which is how you eat, right? And that actually also builds on what you said about the stress. So one of the things that increases your risk of acid reflux, you know what I mean? Is eating quickly, not eating mindfully. You know what I mean? High stress levels when you eat. Not si- So what I always tell my clients is don't eat a meal that should take you 15 minutes and five minutes. Okay. That's one of the main messages I give to my clients. If you don't have the amount of time you need to eat that snack or meal, you either need to find the time, or maybe, especially if you have acid reflux, you probably need to, you know, divert that time and eat at a different time of day or whatever the case may be. Cause that is one of that's, that's one of the, the number of risk factors. And we can keep going back and forth on that, but. Well, and it's funny. Cause like my, my, my parents have always like, you know, gave me a lot of shit about this because I eat way too fast. Right. So, yep. um, which is, you know, I'm just like, they call me like the vacuum sometimes it's like, you just yep. already finished that meal and I haven't even started on my second bite. So like I'm to blame on this, you know, so I'm not right. like, obviously like the best person that, you know, practice what you preach type of thing here. Uh, yep. but like, is this something that from, from some of the research you have done that develops over time, or this is something that is just like, you know, if you eat fast, like this is like, and you, you automatically kind of get reflux. Um, and, and that's something, or it's just something that literally is like, you know, re- repetition kind of like leads to, to maybe that sphincter, that, that kind of door to just start to kind of malfunction type of thing. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So this comes up all the time, right? So it's, it's like my clients will say all the time. Well, you know, you know, Andy, I've been doing this my whole life. Why now? You know, that's like saying, well, I've been running without shoes my whole life and I, I got a broken bone from running on the concrete. You know what I mean? It's going to happen eventually when you don't do, you know, this goes for all bodily physiological things. If you, if you consistently do something that's not optimal over time, you're going to open up yourself to the risk of something going wrong. Right. And eating quickly is only one of the multiple things that can happen. Right. So, but yeah, I mean, that's it. And my friend growing up, my good friend, he was a, a taller, bigger guy. So he, he had, he needs to eat a lot. Right. And he didn't like to take his time. So he dealt with it as well for that reason. He had to eat big meals. He ate very, very quickly. And that's another thing, right. Eating large meals in one sitting, although some people can get away with it, no problem. Right. Obviously that can increase your risk as well right? The more, pre- the more food, the more pressure you have in the system. If the sphincter is not working properly, it's going to open up to a higher chance of reflux as well. So another thing I recommend for people who are dealing with it is, I know it's the cliche, right? Spread your meals out, but this is actually for a real reason here, you know, spreading your meals out, having smaller meals, eating more slowly, eating more mindfully, you know, and to your point about stress, you know, ev- there's evidence that acupuncture and meditation, which are relaxation techniques, they help with acid reflux as well, right? Now, so is there... No. Now, is it a what, quick question here? So, is is there like a direct connection of a stress response in the body with the reflux, or, or you think it's more of a like when we're stressed, we eat faster type of thing, and then we don't really are less mindful, or maybe a combination of both? I, th- I think it's those and more, right? Really. So, uh, like, I'm not going to stretch my uh, my understanding of physiology, but I wouldn't be surprised if when someone's stre- if someone's stressed out. Perhaps there's more production uh, of stomach acid. The muscles definitely don't work as well when you're stressed. You know what I mean? They don't contract and relax the same way, right? Um, and so, and so, yeah. And you may also eat more quickly, right? Okay. So it all is connected, you know. Now, do I, I'm always so curious about this because I eat fast and sometimes I get hiccups. Like you know, and and when you're writing this, like you know, it's it's hiccups something that is like associated with like this entire kind of chain of, of reactions that could be also leading to, to that kind of acid reflux. So I think kind of, I think it's more so like the, the belchy, like those heavy, those heavy burps where there's like, you know, there's something in there, you know what I mean? Not like your normal burp. I think belching is, is one of the, uh, the symptoms. 
or symptoms slash side effects because it mixes and matches a little bit, right? So definitely, if you have those heavier burps that feels almost like stuff is coming up, it's not a good sign. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, if we're talking now specific foods or like I'm, I'm sure like you know you, you talked about one of the things is the how but obviously the what obviously may be also something important to kind of consider yeah. so what have you found to be you know even people working that you're working with that are kind of common either triggers or just just common denominators and in, in, in acid reflux for many people well there's definitely a list of potential triggers, right? So people shouldn't listen to me now and go cut these foods out if they love them and they don't feel bad having them. But you should be aware that these do bother some people. You know, mint is one, onions and garlic is one, spicy food is one, very hot food, like having a soup when it's scalding hot, you know, and part of the reason is, is because if there's damage here already from reflux, it's going to be extra sensitive to stuff like that. Very hot foods are very spicy foods, right? So mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily... That could cause reflux, but it could also damage the tissues that have already been damaged as a result of it, right? So there's definitely that. Um, what have I missed here? I mean, fried foods, like really fatty fried foods, like processed meat, stuff like that are definitely one of the triggers. Citrus foods for some people, tomatoes and tomato sauces for some people. Um, but what about really, alcohol? Alcohol, yeah. Forgot about that. Alcohol and caffeine for some people, absolutely. Those are potential triggers as well. But it comes down to the individual to to have a you know a level of understanding about how these foods affect them, and that's that's hard. It's easier said than done, right? Um, there's one other thing I do want to talk about about that. Like we can get to. We don't have to do it right the second, but it's the laying down after you eat. This is no, very important. Please, topic. please like, get get into it because I, I think I think it's like you know people are like probably like under, trying to understand. Yeah. Okay, like because I think you know from 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 our gathering and the, to summarize obviously obviously up until this point, the how and the what are important, but the how right. seems to be something that a lot of times like it's it's really clear key to to present. And then and I 100% I agree with you on this because one of the things that we did uh, with with this client of mine that I'm kind of like you know reference this as an example is the fact that we like he was like eating like for example like you know gorging his food very quickly he's a doctor he has to go around so he has to do all these different things yeah. right so he's just like running around like you know with the chicken with his like legs cut out and like of course like he's got a lot of different things to do so he was like going and, and eating very mindlessly so i said you know we yeah. can and then he would associate like well i'm having a protein shake and like oh that gets me reflux oh i can have this and i can have that i was like wait, like, do, do you, you, are you 100% is actually the food or maybe the environment in which maybe you were consuming this food? So yep. those are definitely things, some of the things that I wanted to, to just kind of like summarize in here, but yeah, the, the, I guess the situation when you're talking about laying down and things like that, it's something important. So like, let's get into that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a massive, a massive, massive consideration that a lot of people don't think about. So like, look, so I, I looked into this topic because I, I had a strong feeling that this was, a, th a thing, right? Because the reality is no matter how, what, even if you have a, an exceptional diet, you do all the right things, you, the, the, you know, when food is high up in your system, so as in right after you eat, you know, gravity, when you're upright, gravity is obviously helping your muscles push things down, right? As soon as you lay down, you lose the assistance of gravity in clearing food and clearing acid, okay? Now, if you're, if you do this, if you regularly, right, eat large meals and lay down after or go to sleep after, you're going to have, you're going to force these muscles to work over time, right? This can lead to issues. All right. If you already have issues with acid reflux, well, it's not going to end well in that case either. You know what I mean? And so the art, I wrote articles from my website um, to extend the conversation beyond the book. And it, it actually is the most visited page on my website. So what that tells me is people are Googling this question. Are, is, is it bad for your health to lie down after you eat? Right. Obviously people are curious about this. And basically what the studies show is if you have, like they call it the dinner to bed window or dinner to bed ratio, which is the amount of time between when you have dinner and when you like lay down to bed, right? If that period of time is under three hours, you're at higher risk of acid reflux. And that's especially true for people who already have it. Okay. Um, so that's, that kind of, that kind of is what it is. And now that's just one thing to clarify. That's just not about going to bed. It's about not being upright. So like, if you're kicking back like this all the way back, like it's, it's, it's not like that's all good. You know what I mean? It's the same issue. 
So let's just clarify this in a minute, because I think a lot, I, well, a lot of people ask me a question, and I think it's like they ask it from the wrong reasons, which is like, you know, is it bad to eat after like certain time at nighttime, right? So, right. so what you're saying is, is like, you know, it's not for the reasons that most people think like, oh, I'm going to be yep. storing, like, and we work with a lot of big weight loss populations. So it's like, it's not because you're going to be storing body fat. It's mostly because, well, if you eat like a bigger meal and you're going to go and lay down 30 minutes after, then there's still food that are kind of like going down your, your pipes, I guess, like, you know, for the lack of a better term. term I mean, and for that reason, you know, you're, you're, you're increasing your risk of obviously experiencing some of these issues, right? That's a hundred percent it. And that, exactly. That comes up a lot too. It's like, it's you, I don't want you to lay down after you eat, lie down after you eat, not for that, not for that cliche reason that you always hear, but it's because actually it's, it's very likely going to increase your risk of acid reflux. Even if you've gotten away with it up until now, you know what I mean? It's probably not the best practice. Um, and this is something I had to learn the hard way in my life as well, which is actually part of the reason why I was so excited to write this book is I, I, I was without knowing it because when I was younger, I wasn't in tune with this kind of stuff, but I was doing this to myself all the time. And I was so curious as to what the heck was going on. And I mean, of all the things we discussed so far, that change alone is probably, this is purely anecdotal, right? Based on my client population. That's probably the most meaningful thing people could change if they're having these types of issues. Okay. Yeah. Now, one of the main things that you mentioned earlier too was related to like food timing or meal timing, spreading out your meals and things like that. But I also know you're also an expert on the whole concept of intermittent fasting. So I'm now curious and, and to kind of hear your thoughts on, well, not necessarily combining the two things, but first maybe we can kind of get, I wanted to get your, your candid thoughts on intermittent fasting. Um, I have done a lot of podcasts on what it is and what it's not. So we don't really need to get too much into definitions, right. but what are, what are your, like, you know, like your candid thoughts on, on what it is and, and, and how people see it and, and whether it's something that people should do or not. Yeah. Look, okay. I'll try and simplify it. So what I actually tell my clients is this, right? Everything you do, how you eat, how you live is like your birthday cake, right? Which is going to taste amazing, right? If you, if you have the right ingredients. Intermittent fasting for me, it's a concept I'm fascinated by. I don't think it's for everyone. I don't think it's, I, it's definitely not more important than what you eat. Intermittent fasting is your name on the cake. The cake is delicious without that. For some people, it's a nice touch to see their name on it. They don't need it. So that generally sums up how I feel about intermittent fasting. I, I've looked into it. I've written a book on it. I've practiced it in various forms myself. Um, but I don't think it's for everyone. And I also think people need to know this is my, this is my opinion. Well, I'm happy to hear your thoughts. It's never more important than what you actually eat. Um, so a, a great dietary pattern without fasting is always better than a mediocre dietary pattern with some overly elaborate fasting regime. Like there's no yeah. question. Um, I agree. Yeah. So that, that, some, uh, that obviously this is a topic you can discuss forever, but that, that's, that's basically how I feel about it. Well, and I guess like we can tie it up into the conversation about acid reflux, which is, you know, uh, would people that either have a background on it or, or like have any of those kind of like digestive issues that we're talking about, you know, and, and you mentioned earlier about, you know, possibly spitting out the meal. So like, would you say that like an intermittent fasting type of regimen or like having longer times without meals is going to exacerbate, you know, symptoms of acid reflux because most likely meals are bigger um, or is, I'm, I'm sure it's definitely on a case by case basis, but in general terms. Yeah. I think if you are, depend, now this depends on the individual and how they respond, right? Because you could have an individual who maybe they love fasting and they have one meal a day and they're all good. Like, and that works for them. Because when I say that concept about spreading out meals, I'm referring in that case specifically to if you're dealing with issues, right? I'm not saying that's a general prescription for everyone. Um, so that's more specific. Now, so if someone, look, if someone has acid reflux and they're bending over backwards through intermittent fasting, eat one meal a day, and they're still having symptoms, there's no way they should, in my, in my opinion, keep doing that, right? Obviously they're like having, they're detracting from their quality of life. And one of my principles is whether it's fasting or anything else, if it's not adding to your quality of life, you shouldn't be doing it. You know what I mean? Now, obviously there's nuance to that, but, but so if someone was like, like really wanting to try intermittent fasting and they dealt with acid reflux, well, we have to find a happy medium where there's some level of spreading of the meal. So they're not massive, but then also allowing them to put, to, to incorporate this in some way. Um, and of course that's, you know, when you work with a dietitian, you can find those solutions, you know? Well, and then now speaking of talking, working with a dietitian, so like from the practical standpoint and, and right. just kind of like, you know, put on a really nice bow and like the whole acid reflux conversation, like right. what are some of like the most 
you know, like important tips and like applicable things that people may be listening to this podcast can kind of like take away from that even just can go beyond just like the acid reflux conversation. Perhaps they don't have it now, but they obviously may be at risk in the future or maybe have like family or friends that, that do suffer from that. So when you're working with people that have these issues, how do you work through that? It's, and I'm sure it's not just like eliminate this or that. Like what's kind of like your process flow to, to kind of get people to, to feel better and to kind of fix this? Well, it's always the easy money first, right? Are you laying down after you eat at any time during the day? You know what I mean? Are you eating your biggest, are you eating massive meals at night and laying down after you eat? You know what I mean? Are you rushing your meals? Are you trying to, what I said earlier, are you trying to eat a meal that should take 20 minutes? In five, I'll tell you now, I mean, one, I remember one of my clients was telling me that he would set, watch a, a TV episode over a meal to ensure that he took that amount of time to eat. And that actually, that alone solved this issue, right? Now that's anecdotal, obviously that, that's not for everyone, but that just, and this is also re reinforced by the evidence too, but that just speaks to how important how you eat is, right? So are you rushing meals? Are you eating quickly? You know what I mean? Of course, we're going to look at the overall dietary pattern. And if there's massive issues there you know what i mean obviously eating in, in, a, in a better way in a more balanced way will probably also have benefits to how your body's functioning which will then also have benefits to the acid reflux but i'm always going to start with those key concepts because i've seen too many people and the research as well show that those changes alone for many people especially people who are who have a strong dietary pattern right because acid reflux doesn't doesn't like different like uh, discriminate like you can eat well but if you don't eat in the right way, you're going to be a candidate for acid reflux. Even if you eat, up, you know, legumes, kale, whatever it is, like all these great foods, whatever the case may be, like you could still be a candidate if you make these seemingly like simple mistakes. So I always start there because okay. a lot of people do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. They do that. And, and I think just to add on to that, I think one of the main things that I feel for me, it's important. It's like the distraction piece, right? So like, yeah. I mean, how many of us, like we're just sitting down eating um, and like, you know, scro scrolling through social media or like, you know, reading something on the paper. I mean, just like not paying attention to what we're eating or like, sometimes like, I talk, I have like a rule with my clients is like, you know, if you're like, now the people are working in a home, right? So like they're, they're like, you know, because of a pandemic and lockdown. Right. So, so they're just like, they're, they're, they're dining room it's like their that their office desk right so right. like it's it's like understanding okay how can you be less distracted and just be more focused on the food you're eating every bite you're taking and i think that goes in line with like taking your time with it you know yep yeah yep. i'm in my dining room right now so i feel you i feel that you know what I yeah mean? so yeah but i mean yeah acid reflux is one of those things i mean yeah, you can go online and you could find someone going to make it bigger than it is. But honestly, a lot of it boils down to what we discussed. Like sometimes nutrition issues are complicated and sometimes they aren't. You know what I mean? Now, here's an, an, an interesting question. Do you ever find sometimes a lot of people trying to kind of remedy this with medication instead of trying to kind of like address the root cause, which is like the, the conditions and all the different things? Yeah, well, look, I mean, acid reflux is one of the most medication for acid reflux is one of the most commonly prescribed medications in Canada. This is why I'm so compelled to write about it and to talk about it. Right. This means this means to me that this is taking away from people's quality of life in a big way. And that's where like that's what I don't like. I don't like when things can be relatively easily changed to fix your to make your quality of life better. But you don't you don't have access to that information. And so this is what I'm, you know, trying to, trying to accomplish and what I'm doing. So basically, yes, that's, yeah. <laughs> and then, do you see this? And, and again, this is not like, I talk a lot about this and not necessarily kind of attacking or going and kind of going against doctors, but you think a lot of times in the medical field, it's more of a like treatment type of, it's not necessarily a preventive or, or like, it's just more like, yeah, you have acid reflux, here's a medication for it, but never, you don't really kind of see, and I don't know about Canada, like, you know, but people just simply like, like a doctor trying to like, okay, let's just talk about your lifestyle. Let's talk about like lifestyle interventions and figure out what's going to happen in here type of thing. Like, is is that something that you see all the time as well? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the reality is it's like in Canada, especially, right? So it's, it, it, you know, it's public health care. So I think time with a doctor is, is probably it, it's potentially, and I'm not a healthcare system expert, but it's probably, it's, it may be more limited than it is in the States, depending on the type of insurance you have in the States, right? Because in Canada, it's public health care. So you're not going to have an hour with your doctor. So the doctors are doing the best they can with what they've got. Now, that being said, if I have a client come in with this problem, like I'm jumping right to the solution. I'm not going to be wasting time worrying about like whatever else is going on. We're going to get right to fixing it. So I'm not too concerned what happened 
I mean, within reason, like sometimes it comes up. I'm not too concerned with 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 um, what happened elsewhere. We're going to get to the solution right away, you know? Yeah. No, and, and honestly, and just to, to clarify here, like even you guys have public health care. I think the time that doctors are being spending with their client, with their patients in Canada, it's probably like more than it is right. here when okay. we actually don't have public health care. Because when you go to, to a, like, you know, the typical healthcare system here is like you go to a doctor, it's like you get a, a nurse to kind of like, you know, see you and tell you, it's like, okay, this is what's going on with you. Doctor t- kind of sees you up and down like 50 minutes. Okay. Like here's your prescription. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not really uh, that much different here, or at least like it's not, there's not a whole lot of time, which obviously kind of is, is more of a problem. It's like they're trying to kind of address a, a bigger kind of cause of an issue by just simply uh, putting a band aid, which is just simply putting a medication that may kind of cause some like bigger issues in the in the future. Which which is also something I wanted to ask you. Do you yeah. do you think sometimes you know the acid reflux piece like it gets to a point where it is you know like. I guess like not treatable or like when like I'm guessing I'm thinking about it this way. It's like, okay, it's like a door that it not longer really closes anymore. Like, you know, we're talking about like the sphincter in your stomach. Yeah. I mean, well, look, of course there's increasing degrees of severity of this. Right. So I've personally not seen someone so far down that path that they couldn't rectify it by changing their lifestyle. But I don't refute those people exist. Well, there's a reason why it's the most prescribed medication, right? There's a lot of people taking it. So obviously, you know, the more complications someone has, the more things going on, you know, the more challenging it can be in terms of behavior change and adopting these solutions. So for sure, you know, there very likely are people in that situation. I haven't seen them also because I don't work, I, I don't work with the most complex patients. I work with like medium risk people, people who have problems, but not so far gone that they're going to need to be in the hospital system cycling through specialists. Right. So I haven't seen that type of individual, but I'm sure they exist. And if you are someone who is not dealing with your acid reflux, like you could end up in that situation. Now, just one more point I'm going to add in, what, in doing this research, there's also, you know, an observational epidemiological study that showed that people who lay down too soon after they eat chronically are actually at increased risk, risk of stomach cancer, which based on what we've discussed kind of makes sense because there's an interconnection here. It's not fun. It's not physiological, op, physiologically optimal to do that. So perhaps it's no surprise that that's the case as well. So what's the optimal time then from the time that you have a meal until the time that you had to, because there's people even that take naps and stuff like that in the afternoon. So like, what's, what's, uh, in your opinion, the optimal time of timing before you kind of lay, lay down after a meal? Yeah, look, so this, all the studies use three hours as the benchmark to, to, I guess, to differentiate the risk. Um, so that's what I see in the studies. Right. But I, I also appreciate that in the real world, like even in my own life, I don't have with my schedule with my life, I don't have three hours to wait after dinner to go to sleep. So what I do is if I find that I have issues after an hour, I, I make it an hour and a half. So all you can do is the best with what you've got. So if you're going 30 minutes now, that's really not ideal. You know what I mean? Like, can you do 60? Can you do 90? And if you get symptoms at a specific duration, well, you know, like you got to listen to your body. Like you, that's not going to work for you. If you keep having symptoms at that duration, you've got to extend it. And, you know, you're, you don't like some, some number, like 60 minutes might sound like a lot to you. Like your body doesn't know what 60 minutes is. Yeah. Your body doesn't know what 60 minutes is. That's a nice little hour that humans invented. You know what I mean? Like you got to do what your body needs. So if you're suffering with it, make sure you find the ratio that works for you. Yeah. And I think that's like super, super important. Um, okay. So this was like, uh, as far as like applications and I had a question that literally just kind of like completely like blinked out on it that I wanted I to ask it. you in terms of like, instead of like acid reflux, but, um, yeah. So we talked about obviously like the, the, the food specific, like kind of like areas that we kind of had to get into and also like talking about like the, the sort of like the prevent preventive type of measures that, um, uh, we have to really kind of like consider in here. So, um, before we kind of like move into a little more into intermittent fasting, kind of areas is there anything else to add in there that people yeah. should probably be aware of it should know about um, acid reflux i remember it but i'll, I'll let you actually yeah like, you know. yeah no, no there's a few air there's a few areas like that are have little a very little evidence but you know some people like to talk about these like niches where maybe there's something there right i, I like to talk about that too so in the course of my studying so okay so there's, there's limited evidence that probiotics might help, which kind of makes sense. Obviously, there's a connection between gut health and, and the functionality of your system. So probiotics, there's a little bit of evidence there. There's evidence that melatonin might help. Melatonin is an antioxidant, and that might actually protect the esophagus. So there's some evidence for melatonin. Uh, there's evidence as well for psyllium fiber. 
Um, so psyllium fiber, what's this is what's found in Kellogg's all brand buds. It's also sold. I mean, in the States, you probably have a billion products with it because I know you guys have a billion products for everything. So, you know, psyllium fiber, there's a little bit of evidence there. Psyllium fiber, speaking of cholesterol, is very effective at lowering cholesterol as well. So, hey, if you've got two things going on, psyllium fiber will help. Now, there's also, now in Canada, there's, CBD is legal. I know it's, it varies the state to state. There's a little bit of evidence as well that CBD may also be protective of the esophagus. That's very limited. And it's like, not like I go for, tell people to, to do this, but I look at the evidence, I see a little bit there and, you know, cool. You want to you wanna know the alternative means? That's there. A um, little bit of evidence for a Mediter overall Mediterranean style diet to be protective as well. And then med meditation, acupuncture, yoga, like relaxation practices. There's evidence there as well. Um, and I'm pretty sure I've literally just checked every single potential box. <laughs> good. Yeah, the question yeah. I wanted to, and those are really good because I think like I'm huge into meditation. So I definitely yeah. think that's definitely helpful. Um, bariatric patients. I think like, I don't know if you kind of ran into this whenever you were doing a lot of the research, uh, when they have like a gastric band and those kind of things like that, when they're literally like they have like, it's like somebody's like kind of like choking them in the stomach right there, you know, when it comes down right. to that. Like I'm, I see this a lot, even in my own family, I have like a, a, an aunt that has a, um, a, a gastric bypass. So of course it right. makes it a little bit difficult, but do you like, do you run into any, anything on this when you were actually writing your book? Yeah, it's a good question. So I actually have not looked into this specifically. My inclination is that everything that I've just said probably applies double in that case. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's probably that much more important if you're in that situation to pay attention to those principles. It's not something that I've looked into. It's not a population that I'm exposed to in my practice, but I mean, it doesn't mean it's not relevant. It's a good question. But my, my first inclination is that everything that we said is even more important though. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And then just to reiterate, like the, the, the things that has research on it, as far as like you, uh, like that's reflux, psyllium, uh, husk or psyllium fiber. Uh, yep. that's one of them melatonin, which is interesting. Never heard of that before. Yep. Uh, you talk about probiotics, that's some sort of support on there too. Uh, yep. you talked about, uh, what was the, the other supplement you talked about? Uh, CBD, CBD. Okay. CBD, CBD yep. as well. Yeah. Yep. And here in the U S it's like kind of like a hit or miss. You're still, you can get it. It's, it's, it's legal to get it. We, we just literally recorded a previous podcast on this topic talking about the fact that the problem with CBD is that it's not like fully regulated. So like you may right. not be getting actual CBD or like the, the combination between THD, which is the actual component of marijuana is actually yeah. maybe higher than what you really want. So you may end right. up getting high as you're actually kind of trying to, uh, to, to, to kind of fall asleep. So there's a few different things here and there that yeah. I think are important for people to just kind of like be aware of. So, so yeah. that's, yeah, that's definitely fascinating. But I think obviously we kind of cover a big piece on, on the whole acid reflux, uh, part Part of it and then just kind of like revolving to like the whole conversation in regards to like imminent fasting we we talked about yeah. like you know it's sort of like the stamp that you kind of put on the cake of life that you kind of like talk about and um and, and some people just simply like to kind of put a term to that but for you you mentioned like you sometimes you practice some sort of like form of intermittent fasting so yeah. i'm curious to know why like you know or is it more of a lifestyle based approach like it just works for you and works for your lifestyle kind of like because interesting enough i actually do the saying i just don't usually yeah. call it intermittent fasting but i don't right. eat for for a long period of time. So what's yeah. kind of like your, your practice and why do you do it? Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, basically when I, when I talk to my clients and I'm just going to step back one second, I'm going to step into the answer to the question. I always divide intermittent fasting into like the practical and the, and the, and the kind of like a the theoretical or physiological benefit. So like, you know, there's research intermittent fasting, but we don't have the same level of inter research under intermittent fasting that we do on lowering cholesterol. Right. So I call it theoretical slash physiological. There's something there, right? We know there's something there. It's, we can't, I mean, you may, you may be, you may know this better than me. You just, you, you did all, you, all that research on it. There's obviously some physiological effect of it. I don't think we know the full extent and, and what it really means in the long term. I think that's fair to say, right? So, but like, if you're into that, cool. But then there's the practical part, you know what I mean? Which is what you said, like, does it work for your day? Do you find that you're able to, for example, if you're, if you were eating 10 meals a day before, when you eat only four, are you able to pay more attention to what you're eating and have higher quality meals? And, and does that add to your quality of life? That's the practical aspect of it. And that's kind of like why I like it. Like I, I honestly like could care less if it changes my gene expression or like changes how my Alzheimer's gene is expressed. And I've written an article on gene expression and fasting, which is why I bring that up, but I'm more like, you know what? And I, you're right. I don't really call it fasting either. So, you know, cheers for that. I, 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 I see you on that, but it's really just the practical part. I, you know, I like to wake up 
do my thing. I like to eat big meals at night, which also is not great for my own issues, which I've had to, I've had to extend my, my window of time. Right. So I fall into these same habits that my clients do. I just like how it frames my day. And yeah, I like to eat large meals. That's just like how I am. And I, I'd, I'd sooner eat a few large meals than, yeah. than small ones. And that's just a personal thing. I don't push that onto my clients that they should do that. I, 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 you know, I obviously you discuss it with them honestly in terms of how it might fit with their life and if it won't fit at all, but that's why I got into it. And obviously, you know, once I, I, I kind of got into it, I, I, I pitched my publisher uh, the book and they're like, yeah, you know what, we can, we can do a book on fasting and I researched it more. And yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cool concept. Um, not for everyone, not the most yeah. important thing you're going to do, but for the right person, it, you know, it could add to your quality of life. I'm pretty sure like if, if, if we and you and I were roommates, we pretty have pretty much very, very limited, like, you know, similar lifestyles because right, like, I'm right, the same right. way. So yeah. it's like, it's more from like the practical standpoint. I love to have big meals. I typically right. eat bigger things at nighttime because it's when I'm actually less busy, you know, yeah. and, and just simply works from a lifestyle, but I'm not thinking it because of like, I'm going to live longer because there's a rat study that found that you know rats lived like five days more uh whenever right. they were actually kind of prescribed intermittent fasting type of program i think the yeah. research from the theoretical standpoint like there it's there it's just not really as strong as like other kinds of things like that you know so so yep. that's like the, the the bigger thing that i i, I feel like a lot of people what what, it, what is the biggest pet peeve though it's like when people just kind of come to me and thinking that intermittent fasting is some sort of form of a diet like Right. Like Mediterranean diet. No, Mediterranean is a type of diet that has specific kind of like, you know, guidelines and things like that. Intermittent fasting doesn't like it's not like you're vegan. You can totally do that kind of practice from the practical standpoint right. because it's just simply limiting like, you know, time frames in which you're kind of consuming food. But just right. people make this like, oh, like I did. I do the intermittent, the intermittent fasting diet. I was like, what diet is that? It's like, oh, like, so you're just simply eating in this specific time frame, right? right. It's like, yes, it's just like kind of associating terms to it, which I don't think is necessarily always like uh you know ideal but i think from the practical standpoint is really what you're kind of like talking about that it's just more more interesting so i'm guessing yeah. this is kind of the question you ask them right like you know why are you doing it a hundred percent because what i'm cons look and i mean like i look i've, I've researched it like I, I see that you know the early time restricted feeding where you stop eating early in the day there's some evidence that might help with a1c you know i see that there's fasting may have some effects on blood pressure you know it, it may change some gene expression oh it's all cool stuff it may change a little bit how your mitochondria work that's all good but you know what i'm more concerned about because i don't think that's going to change someone's life but if they do get too dogmatic about fasting like that could change their life in, the, in a bad way so that's what concerns me the most i don't want people like pigeonholing themselves or bending over backwards to try and do fasting at the, at the consequence of their quality of life at the, at the their food choices, at their happiness, just because like their friend is doing it or they read online. It's the only way to like be healthy or happy. So I'm actually more concerned about that part of it, even though I'm a fan of it. Like I see the dark side, the potential dark sides. And that actually concerns me despite the fact I love writing about it or researching it. You know what I mean? There's always yeah. two sides to the coin. Yeah. Um, and I think so. it's like the people that just kind of consider as well, like, oh, this is superior, kind of like the, the whole keto group. It's like, you know, like this is superior to anything else. Like this is how you're going to lose weight, live better, like all the different things like that, which I think this is ex extremisms and absolutes. It's really what I kind of like try to avoid. It's just simply kind of whatever works for you, which I think it's like the mostly the ideal kind of scenario here. Yeah, 100 so. percent. Cool. 100%. That's awesome. Cool, man. Well, we're coming. I want to be respectful of your time. So we're coming towards like the very tail end of our uh, yeah. our time here together. But uh, before we kind of get into some of like the ways and people can kind of like find one of your seven books or like kind of read yeah. a little bit more about you. Um, I always like to do a quick like little well, is there before we kind of get into like the rapid fire questions with just like kind of like fun things to just kind of like, you know, uh, and, and a really nice note. Is there anything else that you want to like, you know, the audience that are listening to here to kind of like know in any other topics that we discuss, whether is you know um, like acid reflux you know practical applications around that like specific foods or eat intermittent fasting that you th you thought was something that we didn't cover that would be helpful yeah i mean honestly i, I think well, we, we definitely covered acid reflux really comprehensively i mean intermittent fasting is, is obviously like a, a massive topic so i think we did a decent job of the most important parts i mean look i got books on both those things so if people want to you know read those books all the better you know what I mean? But no, I think we did a pretty, pretty decent job. And if anyone out there, well, I'm just going to plug myself for one second. If anyone out there wants to like 
take the writing to the next level, step more into the writing world. I do help people who, who especially nutrition professionals who, who want to like improve their writing and learn how to promote and structure their work. So uh, you can reach me. Uh, you can reach me for that as well. So awesome. I love that. Uh, so, and we're going to get a lot of like links and stuff like that to, to your stuff, Andy. But, and, and before we get into that, like here's some like rapid fire questions. Yeah. Like, if it, like the rules are simple, you just need to kind of like, answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. 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 So yeah. first one would be uh, your favorite exercise. Soccer. Okay. That's a good one. I knew that because I saw like, I've seen a lot of your stuff on your social media. Awesome. Uh, second would be uh, your favorite book that everybody should have on their bookshelf. The Count of Monte Cristo. Okay. Love that. Um, favorite um, source of information, podcast, YouTube channel, or something that you think people should check out? How about my blog? Or okay. your podcast. <laughs> there you go. I like the blog. I was like, I was kind of like, I was like looking into it. I was like, wow, this like when I, when I last time I looked at this blog had like probably like three categories. Now it has like a million. That's awesome, dude. Like, I know you've been kind of like super diligent with like posting like consistently. How many articles do you have in there? I don't, honestly, account? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I haven't counted, but uh, yeah, I love writing. So, you know, it comes, how often, comes how often do you post? Like, do you post like at least like once a week, once a month or sometimes? Depends on my schedule allows, you know, you know how it goes. Sometimes you have more time to pursue these things and sometimes you have less time. So what my schedule allows, I do. Obviously now I don't have as much time to write as I used to, um, but I always try when I can. Okay, cool. No. Last question would be if you were uh, stranded on a desert island and you can live or with one food compound or not, or one food only, for the rest of your life, what would you choose? I'm going to say kale, independent of the practical aspects of <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> I figure. I knew I knew the answer to that question. I had to, I had to, I had to right? You, like, you I had to promote, you had to promote, you had to promote the brand. That's to. your brand, yeah. bro. <laughs> yeah, That's awesome, man. So before we kind of like wrap it up, Andy, how can people find you, learn about you, uh, talk to you, check out, check you out? Yeah, well, I would recommend, you know, check me out on, on Instagram, Andy, at Andy the RD. Right. Or mm -hmm. that's my website as well. Andy, the RD. So like obviously Andy, the, it stands for Andy, the registered dietitian, but just Andy, the RD. If you want, if you want to know if I've heard a topic on something, go on Google, type in Andy and the topic, Andy, soy, Andy, intermittent fasting, my article will probably come up um, or type in Andy, Amazon author. Like you'll see my, my author page or we can put the link in the bio so you can see all my books. I got another yep. one coming up in April. Um, yeah, that's about it. It's Instagram or my website, my blog. That's where all the action's going on. Awesome. Cool. Uh, speaking of actions, we're going to do another little action shot here and for Instagram. So just smile nice. for a picture. One, two, and three. There you go. Awesome. Um, cool, man. Well, Andy, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to, we're going to make sure that we link all those different things. And I do, I, I know you provide a lot of those things already to me. So yeah. uh, we're going to make sure we kind of like link everything up on your, uh, on the show notes and, and definitely pe like, you know, for the people listening to this podcast, like go and check him out and uh, check out a lot of like the resources and information. If you're interested in any of the topics that he writes about, highly recommend you get one of his books. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll maybe have him in the podcast and, you know, soon enough. And I'm sure the next time I'll have you, you're probably going to have another 17 books out so or at least one at least one <laughs> is there anything that you're currently on the works right now that people should know about i, I do have one of the works it's i'm gonna start promoting it soon technically i'm not allowed to say what it is it's not like a, a, a big deal but i'm just like not supposed to say it but you'll see soon enough don't worry okay cool <laughs> thanks awesome. for having me man it was well, awesome yeah thank you so much andy for your time and for people listening in thank you so much for tuning in to uh the nutrition blueprint podcast we'll see you guys on the next one